let's start with prayer. Merciful Father, we pray this day for your blessings as we study your word. Help us understand it and apply it in our lives. Bless us this day as well as we receive your gifts through the service once more, your grace and forgiveness, and by it preserve us in these evil times. For Jesus' sake, amen. All right. Uh, we are in chapter 14 of Romans. Chapter 14 of Romans. We did not finish last week. In fact, I think we spent the whole week last week on verse 1, or the first verse, verse 14. So, we are looking at verse 15 in Romans 14. Last week we spent our time discussing sins against conscience. Uh, and, um, you know, how, how a conscience can be misguided and turned off, how we don't necessarily trust our conscience to be a definer of truth because there are things our conscience is bothered about that it shouldn't be and other times where it isn't bothered when it should be. So conscience is not necessarily trustworthy in all things, but our conscience is in fact uh, something God has given us that we should listen to and not sin against. If something tells us in our head it's wrong to do, then we shouldn't do it. And if we do it, it is wrong because in our minds, we've transgressed the laws of God. So anyway, we spent virtually the entire week last week talking about that as it comes out in verse 14 of chapter 14 in Romans. So we'll start in verse 15 and finish out chapter 14. Yes? Certainly may. Because it's happened in my life. When a... Uh, a person is troubled by their conscience, it's, it's very helpful for them to come consult with their pastor. Because sometimes they're troubled by their conscience thinking that they sinned when pastoral care can show them that they did not sin. Mm -hmm. and so right. Your pastoral care is very important when a conscience is being troubled. Mm -hmm. Take advantage of your, of your pastor's uh, position of, of counsel and um, pastoral care. Yes, thank you. And uh, it can be utterly tormenting sometimes what your conscience does to you. One of my first experiences at the seminary, they make you go and do hospital calls and nursing home calls on people you don't know just to train you in the seminary. And I was walking, I was walking down the... Uh, nursing home hallway when some little old lady as I go by her room yells at me or I go by father father and uh, I stuck my head in her room said asked if she needed some help said, come here she was obviously Roman Catholic thought I was a priest I told her I was Lutheran it didn't seem to matter but she had she was utterly tormented she was, you know, so old as she couldn't get out of bed anymore. Um, but her priest, at some point along the way, told her that she was never married because she didn't get married in the church building proper. And she had, you know, had a husband and children and all of this. And she, she was convinced in her conscience she had been living in sin her entire life because the priest told her, that she wasn't actually ever married because she didn't marry in the church building. And now that she was getting near death, her conscience was just consuming her with this. She thought she was going to go to hell for this. So, you know, I, I did explain to her I'm not a priest, but um, it's not a sin. You know, your conscience, is, your conscience is tearing you apart over something that is not sinful. I never saw her again, so I don't know the, what impact that had, but, you know, that, that can happen. All right, verse 15 now, chapter 14. 
So, yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the man for whom Christ died. Here's that food issue again. Um, so, if your brother is grieved, it said. The word grieved, you see it explained in the Greek. And Do you still have last week's handout? Yeah? yeah? Okay. So you see it explained at the top of the page there. Uh, to distress, to grieve, to cause pain, to vex. Um, from the Greek word that literally means deep grief, deep emotional pain, severe sorrow. So here it would refer to a spiritual crisis. Uh, it would make someone question uh, what it was they were part of. That if this person is a Christian, maybe I shouldn't be associated with them. So if your brother is grieved, if, if they're thrown into the spiritual crisis because you're running around eating stuff that in their mind they're convinced is sinful, then you're destroying the faith of that one, whether it's sinful or not. Because you know, the foods people were eating were not sinful. But there were those t for whom they were in their, mo in, their, in their misguided conscience. So Paul says, don't eat them. Therefore, verse 16, therefore do not let your good be spoken of as evil. Uh, good meaning freedom. You're free to eat this stuff if you want. Um, but if you're, if you're doing it in the face of people who are convinced it's sinful, then they're going to run around saying you're evil and what you believe in is evil. Uh, your, your whole faith is going to be held up in ridicule in front of the world. So don't let your, your good, that is your freedom, to do as you, as you will, because God's word hasn't spoken to it. He's spoken of as evil. Verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Uh, so the hand, on the handout, Paul again grounds his discussion in specific things. He's talking about eating certain foods and how that might impact others. This is not a broad discussion on all law. It's important for the church today that it stay focused on what the church really is all about, namely Christ's righteousness, the peace we have in grace, the work and gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's easy for the church to get sidetracked by other non-doctrinal issues, and it happens in the church all the time. Controversies over stuff that doesn't matter and losing sight of the bigger picture. You know, what color carpet are we going to put in? You know, what color are we going to paint the walls? How much is the windows going to cost? And people melt down over stuff like that when it's irrelevant. So allow people their freedoms and don't get sidetracked. Verse 18, for he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. So this is a service to Christ, being mindful of, of others' conscience. Uh, not, not purposely doing things to make others question their faith. For he who serves Christ in these things. Verse 19, Therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Uh, the mindset that individual Christians should bring to the church, a desire to be at peace with others and build others up. Uh, when it says, verse 19 there, um, to edify others, the word edify is spelled out for you on the handout too. Uh, and, and it actually has, um, the word oikos in Greek is the word for house. So it's literally house building, the act of building, spiritual advancement, edification. So to edify others is to build them up like you're building a house. Christians ought to be builder-uppers, not terror-downers. You know, not complaining all the time about everything, but actually thinking about building others up in their faith. So let us pursue the things that make for peace and the things by which we may build one another up, literally. Uh, that is, focus on, on faith things, not on the non-essentials, non the stuff that doesn't matter and God hasn't addressed.
All right, verse 20. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. Do not destroy the work of God. What is the work of God that could be destroyed if you're stomping on somebody else's conscience? What's that? Salvation. Salvation <laughs> and God's love, both are correct, yes. Faith. You know, e eternal life, the gospel itself. That's what you can wreck in another person's life when you start insisting on stuff that God hasn't spoken to. And then all things indeed are pure. See, that's the, a restatement of everything he's been talking about. And he's talking specifically about things neither commanded nor forbidden. When he says all things, uh, that should not be read in such a way that there is no law and there's no sin. You know, it's okay if you want to do sinful things because all things are pure to God. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about things neither commanded nor forbidden by God's word, like eating certain foods. So all of these things are pure. It doesn't matter whether you do it or not do it. But it is evil for the man who eats with offense. But if you think it's sinful and you do it and sin against your conscience, it's a sin. Verse 21. So it's a lot of repetition through this. He kind of is repeating himself over and over. And the reason for that is precisely because this is what was happening in Rome. This is what the Christians were doing. And not just Rome, in fact. This was a universal problem in the early church. As, as Christianity spread among the pagan Romans, uh, Christians constantly had to contend with this business of eating foods that had been offered to idols and whether you should do it or not. And the reasoning being, because an idol is nothing, so what does it hurt if I eat food offered to nothing? And that's true. Paul grants you that. Yep, that's, that's a correct principle. But there are other people who are offended and think you're actually... Uh, actually verifying the legitimacy of these idols and their worship by eating. So don't do it, even though theologically you're right. It, they are nothing. Uh, we see him address exactly the same problem in Corinth. So this is a problem everywhere throughout the, these uh, churches, early Christian churches in Roman territory, because this was a Roman custom among their gods. You ate potluck meals at temples and invited the whole community to it. Verse 21, it is, a, it is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or made weak. So uh, we have a duty to the weaker brother and not to do stuff in front of them that's going to make them stumble in their faith. Verse 22, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves. So, yeah, we have these Christian freedoms, and we are free to exercise them, but in such a way that it doesn't stomp on the faith of others. Exercise them in private, then, he says. 23, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith, for whatever is not from faith is sin. That last sentence, whatever is not from faith is sin, is the guiding principle for everything he's been saying so far. Whatever is not from faith is sin. If you do something and, 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 it's, and it's, you're convinced somehow this is not true to your faith, then you're sinning, whether it actually is or not. Uh, on the back of the handout is a quote from Luther. And the passage, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin, means that every person who does not wish to sin must believe, for faith alone is without sin. Therefore, he who does something he does not believe sins. Thus, he who eats what he thinks is unclean sins, not so much because he sins against his thinking as because he is lacking in faith whereby he would know that it is not unclean. 
A corollary of this is that everyone who is lacking in faith sins even when he does a good work. For this is the meaning of the passage. Yeah, faith alone justifies us before God. Faith, faith gives, uh, cements us in Christ's grace with just, which justifies us. Without faith, we are not justified and everything we do is sinful. Because it does not please God. It does not proceed from faith. All right. That's chapter 14, uh, almost exclusively dealing with the sin against conscience and how we treat others. Any comments or any questions? Does faith solely mean believe? Faith is a loaded word. Yes, it is. Uh, my prophet, the Sem, used to call loaded words pregnant words. Words that, that held so much more. But yes, you're right. Faith, faith is something more than a mental believing. Um, faith, as Paul describes it, probably the best description, faith is the presence of the Holy Spirit within us. Faith is God working in us to grasp the gifts God gives us. So, it's, it is believing it's receiving, it's trust, you know, it's hope, it's lack of fear, it's, uh, it's, it's life works, living out things, living out this Holy Spirit within us. Uh, it's what we say with our tongue. Faith is, is all of it, together. Anything the Holy Spirit would work within us to grasp God gifts and confess God in the world is all part of faith. Yeah, and this, but the, the faith is receiving thing, I think, has to be put right at the front of that. Because there are so many who believe they have faith, but they have no avenues for receiving God's grace in their life. I mean, they think they're forgiven, but they don't receive forgiveness in anywhere other than their own thoughts. You know, they never, they don't come to the Lord's Supper. They don't hear an absolution. They, they don't read God's word. So they may have part of faith. They may have knowing certain things in the Bible about Jesus, but the, the receiving, which is the most important part of it, they don't have. So faith has to be all of it. Any other thoughts before we move to chapter 15? Okie dokie, chapter 15. All right, so he has not finished this discussion yet. Uh, he's very much trying to bring peace to a troubled congregation. So the, the, the warring parties, the Greek converts or the Roman converts versus the Jewish converts and the conflict that was coming up between them. Verse 15, verse 1, chapter 15 rather. We then who are strong ought to, ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. So there is a recap of the previous chapter. Scruples, interesting word. Uh, in the Greek, you see it on the handout, an infirmity, a weakness, a doubt, hesitation. Uh, from the word meaning without strength. It is only used here in the New Testament. So people who are weak, who, who hesitate, nervous in their faith about whether it's right, now, notice, he doesn't say all views are equal here. He does differentiate between the strong, those who understand God's word rightly, and the weak, those who have the basics, but still don't understand how this or that doctrine impacts some practice. Uh, people are at different stages in their faith and different levels of strength. 
so we, we ought to be sensitive to, to those who are weak and could stumble because of our witness. Uh, second asterisk, this does not mean that those who understand doctrine rightly should put up with false doctrine. The topic here is adiaphora, not doctrine. The issue is how our Christian faith and God's word is applied to certain situations where God's word has not clearly spoken. So, you know, for instance, in the seminary, one of the things they tell you is if you get into a congregation, you know, fresh into the congregation, don't make a whole lot of changes at once. Go slowly. Now, that's fine up to a point. You know, but what if you get into a congregation where they have open communion? Should you put up with open communion and slowly try and bring them around to practicing biblical closed communion? Uh, and that's, that's where I disagreed with some of my seminary professors. They would say, yeah, you put up with it. And I say, no, you don't, because that's false doctrine at that point. You don't put up with false doctrine. So you change it, and then try and teach as you're doing it. But if you're coming into a situation where there's some practice that is a little off, or something that's, you know, not, not historically correct or whatever. Well, if we're just talking practice and not something that's patently false doctrine, then you, then you go slowly. Then you leave it for years, maybe, and slowly bring it around. But when it comes to false teaching, you cannot tolerate false teaching and false doctrine. So within the church, you know, we... We can put up with a lot of things, but when it comes to false doctrine, you've got to put our foot down. And you can lovingly try and put your foot down, but you cannot tolerate something that's patently false. So we have to keep in mind that what Paul is talking about here is not putting up with false doctrine. Any thoughts? All right. Uh, lastly, he tells us not to please ourselves here. That is, it is not about what we want. And when it comes to matters that are not commanded or forbidden in God's word, then it is a matter of what we want or don't want. It is purely uh, what sits right with our conscience. Uh, look in James. James addresses this too. Uh, James chapter 3, verse 17 James has been in our readings a lot lately. Uh, it's, it's questionable which James wrote this. There were actually three of them around Jesus. Two disciples named James. And James the greater, James, James the lesser, and James the brother of Jesus. It's thought that this epistle is written by James the brother of Jesus. At least many think that, not everybody. Um... Uh, who at first was not a believer and really didn't even come to believe in Jesus until after the resurrection. And he, 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 he believed with a passion from that point on. Uh, after the resurrection, James, the brother of Jesus, rises in prominence in the church and actually becomes the head pastor of the church in Jerusalem uh, with all the other disciples. So he's kind of right there, named among the greats, like Peter. So James, chapter 3, verse 17, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Uh, this, is, this is the reading for today, in fact, in, in church. This business of willing to yield, right in the middle of that list. There's your, there's your conscience issues. The stronger should be willing to yield to the weaker for the sake of their faith and eternal life. You don't teach somebody by trying to cram something down their throat. Uh, 
I've seen a couple of situations of, of young pastors who feel the need to, to teach their congregation what they think is teaching by just cramming it down their throat. You know, like issues, you know, minor issues like the flags. You know, we got our flags here. For years, the flags were up front. Uh, I've seen churches where they are right smack next to the altar on either side. Proper, this is, a, this is a, one of those adiaphora things. Properly speaking, that's not the right place for the flags is up near the altar. Because when you're up near the altar, that's about one thing only, receiving grace. It's not about being patriotic. We save the patriotism for other places. You know, the proper place for a flag is actually in a fellowship hall like this, not down front. But there, there are pastors that come in, see the flags, and just plain pick them up and move them. This happened in my former congregation with a pastor that followed me. And uh, Without any explanation, you've got a bunch of veterans in your congregation, and all of a sudden, the new guy comes in and yanks the flag out of the front. To them, it looks like he's dissing the country. So his freedom, the pastor's freedom to do the right thing because his faith properly instructed him that that's not the appropriate place, winds up offending the weak who don't understand that and who take great offense at it, and then that one little problem can cause a huge problem with everything else he does from there on out, because now nobody trusts him and everybody thinks he's a tyrant. You know, it's a little thing like that, trying to cram something without proper instruction. Now, if he should teach the people over time and get everybody on board that, yep, that's not the right place for these things. We're not, we're not saying anything negative about patriotism or our country. We want to honor our country and be good citizens. It's just there. It's about Jesus, and we should put those someplace else. You know, if everybody else can be taught that and brought on board, and everybody says, yeah, that's right. I think, I think we agree with that. Let's do it. That's how it should be done. But just jumping ahead and doing something does nothing but explode situations. All right. Same, actually, same with our baptismal font. When I got here, the baptismal font was someplace else. I don't remember where it was. In, off to the side. Yeah. And, um, you know, the proper place is in the front so that you literally have to walk by it to get up to the altar for communion and be reminded of your baptism. That's the historic place for it. But it's neither commanded nor forbidden in Scripture. If you have it off to the side, that's not a sin. If you're not breaking God's word. Um, but I remember mentioning it a couple of times in an elders meeting and I don't remember, I don't remember who the elders were at the time, but they just, okay, yeah, that's right, let's move it, <laughs> grabbed it and move it and threw it in the middle and I'm, I'm good with that. It worked fine. Uh, now everybody's used to it. But, you know, just little stuff like that, little, little things that are neither commanded nor forbidden. It might be good practice, um, but to just do stuff unilaterally can hurt a church. All right, so at any rate, uh, back to the scruples, you know, the, the weak, being the strong, being mindful of the scruples of the weak. And here in James 2, a willingness to yield. The strong have to be willing to yield to the weak for the sake of their faith, not force things. Any thoughts before we continue? Back to Romans 15, verse 2. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. Uh, please our neighbors. Uh, the Greek word uh, to satisfy, to make good on something. Uh, winning someone's favor because of meeting their expectations. It is not living for ourselves to please ourselves, but trying, trying to bring peace with others. And leading to his edification, leading to his building up. There's that word again that literally means building a house. Our, our eye should be towards building others up around us, not tearing them down. Uh, the point of pleasing, winning favor, is, and, and the Greek literally reads on the handout here, you see it, into the good for building up. So we're mindful of others' 
faith and what they think and what their conscience tells them into the good for building them up, for the good of their souls, to build them up in faith. Uh, we call this the law of love. That is, we put ourselves after others, particularly the weak, and we yield to them in matters of conscience with an eye toward leading them into the truth and strengthening them in their faith. And just because your conscience may tell you something today uh, does not mean that 10 years down the line your conscience is going to believe the same thing if it's neither commanded nor forbidden. You know, you can teach someone truth and change their conscience if it's a weak conscience. Compare 1 Corinthians 10, 23 to 31, and here you see Paul, again, dealing with this issue in Corinth. So this, this was literally a problem everywhere throughout the early churches. And it's such a, such a human problem, you know? It, it not, it's not a matter of overt sin. It's just showing love to one another and being respectful of each other's weaknesses. And it's a problem today just like it was then. 1 Corinthians 10, 23 to 31. All things are lawful for me. Again, he's talking adiaphora things. But all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but all things do not edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Eat whatever is sold in the market, asking no questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. If any one of those who do not believe invites you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no questions for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I give thanks? Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jew or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved." So exactly the same problem in Corinth as was happening in Rome. If you go to somebody's house and they put food in front of you and tell you it's offered to an idol, don't eat it. Not for your conscience sake, but for theirs. You know, be mindful of the witness that might give. All right, any thoughts or questions there? Yes? Just kind of skipped over, is there ever a point where the strong in faith should insist that the weak follow their way of doing oh, things? Oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Correct, I did. So what about that? Is there ever a point where the strong in faith should insist that the weak follow their way? What do you think? Or is it always the weak, have, if they're strong, always have to yield to the weak? At what point do the strong not yield to the weak? <laughs> if it's against God's word? If it's against God's what? The rules, laws. The rules, laws, yes. If it's a clear matter of God's word speaking to something, and the strong understand it but the weak don't, like, you know, like that closed communion issue. If God's word has spoken clearly, saying that people's souls can be hurt if they commune without proper faith and instruction, which the Bible does say, uh, then the strong have to stand by that, even if the weak don't get it. So yeah, if it's a, if it's a clear matter of God's word speaking to something, then the weak need <laughs> need to uh, recognize their weakness and change. But even that, you know, it should be done in a way that's as gentle as humanly possible. 
but without compromise. Or if it's a matter of, you know, there are broader implications that the weak one may not be seeing. Which in that case, it's kind of like a parenting thing, you know, where the parents may understand something that the kids don't yet. And so mom and dad say, don't do this, even though the kids has no idea why. You know, because mom and dad understand that if you do this, then there are going to be these consequences or these people affected by it, so you just don't do it. You know, if it's something like that where other people could be negatively impacted and the strong in faith get it, then the weak need to, need to yield. So, it's, it's, not, it, it's not a very clean-cut thing. It gets messy. Now, this is one of those areas of faith and practice that can get just plain messy. Right? Yes. You know, I guess Pastor Johnson's example last week about the, uh, the business that the, he, has to, he has to be careful of with the Meskwaki thing and how their, their spirituality and what they might consider to be spiritual that we wouldn't or what they might be considering yielding to their spirituality that we wouldn't think of. You know, these, these are things that have broader implications. As, as he said, too, about how, how he reacts and what he does at these things may impact other people who are not, who are Christians serving in that setting who don't understand what to do. And they, they come to him afterwards and thank him for having taken the stand he did because they didn't know what to do. Um, you know, that's an example of the weak need to follow the strong sometimes. All right, anything else? All right, then back to 15, verse 3. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So Jesus uh, did not, was not in the world to please himself, but to suffer for others, I guess is the point. Verse 4, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Whatever things are written before, that is the Old Testament, uh, the law and the prophets, uh, these were written for our learning to teach us uh, that we through patience and comfort might have hope. Uh, patience, uh, literally uh, enduring, steadfastness, waiting for. Uh, comfort, uh, calling to one's aid, encouragement, exhortation, consolation. Uh, from the word uh, that we use for the Holy Spirit, paraclete, the comforter. So the Old Testament was written uh, to provide us with this you know, spiritual comfort that we might have hope, looking forward to God's things. So uh, the point being here that the Old Testament he's talking about, this was with the Jews especially in Rome, the Jewish converts. They were following the Old Testament. And they were still following the Old Testament laws, which now were no longer in force. Because they were civil laws and ceremonial laws, they were not moral laws. Paul is saying, look, the, what was written before, these, these old commands, these old laws, were written for our good. There was a purpose behind these civil laws and ceremonial laws. And that purpose was to offer comfort and hope, to point to the Messiah, to point to grace and eternal life. So that served a purpose. We're not just jettisoning the Old Testament. We are rooted in Christ as the Old Testament was. That was the point of it. So don't disrespect people just because they're following 
the Old Testament laws yet because they don't get it. Their conscience is still weak. They're growing in faith. They were written in the past. They're following these old laws, and those laws had a good purpose. So be patient with them as they come around. Uh, now the purpose is, is founded in Christ, not in the law itself, which was the, the jump they had to make, which they weren't making yet. Verse 5, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus. So God is patiently waiting for the Jews to come around as he was patiently waiting for the Gentiles to come around. You know, God is bearing with everybody's weakness in their own way, so we should be like-minded towards one another. That is, like-minded in terms of God's mind, God's patience and comfort that he showed us, we should be showing others. Uh, this is one of those, those things where it, the, the theological term is theosis, uh, becoming godlike. Uh, it's a false doctrine as the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, all the Orthodox use it. They mean, they mean uh, it's, a, it's a major part of their theology, theosis, that they become more godlike through mystical experiences. Uh, through their mind and their experience of God in these kind of intangible ways. And that the purpose of the gospel is to make them more godlike. Uh, that's, that's a major false teaching in orthodoxy. But there is a proper understanding of this becoming godlike. And this is it. That God shows us his grace and love and we express that grace and love in the world. And in that sense, we Im imitate God. So this is, this is a huge thing God has given us. This isn't just law, do it because I'm telling you to do it. This is, you actually get to imitate God. This is what God is. We express God in the world by being as God to those around us. It's, this is, it's more privilege than law. All right, verse 6. That you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this unity in verse 5 you have with God, to be like-minded with God, becomes a unity we have with one another. Verse 6, with one mind and one mouth glorify God. So as we are one with God, we become one with others. Uh, this this like-mindedness thing. Again, a reoccurring New Testament theme. This isn't just something he said to the Romans. Philippians, chapter 1, verse 27. Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. You know, he tells the Philippians to be of one mind, one spirit. Uh, 1 Peter 3.8, there Peter tells people to be one. Look that one up quick. 1 Peter, Peter 3.8. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil. And then also in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that, you, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. So oneness together, same mind, same judgment, same confession. This is God's image for the church. This is what it is to imitate God. As we are joined to God through word and sacrament, we become one with one another under these things. This is not a American agreeing to disagree. This is striving for the same mind and same judgment in God's word. All while the strong are bearing with the scruples of the weak. Explain that. Um, 
remind me what the server spoke over there, please. I want to make sure I don't <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's our service today. And we pray. Uh, for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Mm -hmm. So we do pray for unity. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the irony is that we Lutherans have a reputation as being standoffish and distant from everybody else and not wanting to be one with others. That's, that's a reputation we have because we don't join in community worship things, you know, and, and the world perceives us as being even divisive in a way because we don't go along with everything. But in point of fact, we want to be one with everyone. It's just the standard for that oneness has to be God's word. It has to be what God has said, not a unity of agreeing to disagree when it comes to doctrine. We can't join in with that stuff because that would be participating in false doctrine and that would also be to confirm other people hurting their consciences confirming them in false beliefs. We proclaim truth by saying, this is the truth, come and join us in it. And when we do find church bodies around the world that, that are in fact one with us, we announce fellowship and we'll commune with them and you know, share pastors together. Uh, there was, there's a major church in Africa you, you're, you're more the missionary type, you know this more than I, that was in fellowship with the ELCA that for years, and it's like seven million members or something, it's a huge Lutheran body, uh, and they were fellowship with the ELCA, but came to recognize that the teaching of the ELCA is contrary to Scripture, and they have broken away from the ELCA, and I think they're in talks with the Missouri Synod, and we're trying to teach them, and they are coming around, and someday, hopefully, we'll have fellowship with them, right? Is that, is that well, accurate? There are actually, two different church bodies in Africa. One is in the island of Madagascar, which they have like seven or eight million members, and then the church in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And we're so both, both of those church bodies have. have Expressed disapproval with the, and there was statute confessed the illness against the ELCA now, or not just the ELCA, ELCA is an American with the British body, the um, um, Lutheran World Federation. Lutheran World Federation, yes. Right. Yeah, which, which means that they are, they are Lutherans that are standing against the church body they are part of, confessing truth in the face of error. And now we are in conversation with them and hopefully we'll, we'll help them. They're bigger than us, but we offer a level of theological education that they don't have. And that's our greatest strength in the missionary world, is our ability to offer theological education. Right. So we teach these other Lutheran bodies all over the world. Uh, the truth. Sometimes we bring their pastors over here and train their pastors, and their pastors go back and, and teach. And that was my assignment when I worked for the International Mission. That's why Pastor Rieger went with me once or twice over to Europe and Siberia to teach. Right. My responsibility was to train the pastors uh, in a level where they weren't able to receive it because under communist rule, or just the inability to offer theological education because of finances. Right. Uh, you know, the Missouri Center was able to send people yeah. over to provide that education. The, the Missouri Center really teaches the world. It's, it's really, that's our strength as a synod. And, and what they offer us is probably even more valuable, which is a, you know, a genuine passion for bearing the cross in a way we don't in this country and maintaining the faith. So, uh, at any rate, though, a little, a little off topic, the, the, the idea of the one mind thing, the one heart. When we recognize God's word 
uh, speaking to an issue, we stand in it and we want to join with others and we are actively pursuing unity with others all around the world and even in this country. Uh, we want that unity, but it's got to be a unity based on the word. And when, when the word is violated, then the unity is broken. Just recently, what church body was it that just okayed women's ordination that we broke from Japanese Lutheran Church? Yeah, the Lutheran Church in Japan just recently voted in women's ordination. And we had been in fellowship with them. And we just broke that fellowship now because they strayed away from God's word. So this is an active, ongoing process all the time. But the Latvian church voted in the Constitution that male only clergy. So they went from allowing women clergy to recognizing that ordination of women was not in conformity with God's word. Right. It, goes. it doesn't always just go the one direction towards liberalism. We got to quit. Any comments, any thoughts thus far? All right, let's close then there with prayer. Lord God, we pray for your blessings upon your church. We pray that you grant us unity in spirit and true love for one another, that the strong may bear with the weak and the weak may grow in faith. We pray likewise that you grant us a good witness in the world, that others may be drawn to your truth and to the saving grace that you offer here. Be with us for Jesus' sake. Amen.